Welcome to the ITU studio in Geneva for the occasion of GSR 2018, the Global Symposium for Regulators. I'm very pleased to be joined in the studio today by Urs Gasser, who is the Executive Director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and also Professor of Practice at Harvard Law School. Urs, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, a project that I know you've been uh, recently uh, involved with. It's the newly launched AI for Development series. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that, some of the key findings, perhaps some of the, the recommendations that, that come from this. Happy to do so. So we uh, wrote a paper as a contribution to this series focusing on setting the stage for AI governance. So everyone is talking about uh, artificial intelligence and its many different applications, whether it's self-driving cars or um, personal assistance on the cell phone or use of AI in health. And it raises all sorts of, of uh, governance questions, questions about how these technologies should be regulated uh, to mitigate some of the risks, but also, of course, to embrace the opportunities. And in this paper, what we do based actually on a a series of uh, conversations we've had with global policymakers over the last year is somehow distill a few core themes that we've heard uh, and help policymakers to um, to um, chart the pathway forward, which uh, is is actually quite challenging. And I can expand a little bit more if you're interested. Yes, yeah, so that'd be great. I mean, I wanted to know. I mean, how how can AI help d development? I mean, there are many, many enormous benefits where this combination between large data sets that we have available and really advanced algorithms can shape outcomes in terms of uh, how we treat um, diseases or uh, how, you know, how we give care to, to patients or uh, how we make transportation more efficient. So there are many, many positive uses also in the context of the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN. Um, but yet again, there are also real challenges for policymakers. And just mentioning three that we cover a little bit in our contribution. One is uh, really about the uh, complexity of the technology. Um, if you look at it, there is actually a relatively small group of people who understand the technology, and there are potentially, you know, a very large population affected by the same technology. And so the same applies to policymakers. Many of these technologies are developed in private companies. Uh, and yet policymakers, you know, are wondering how to regulate or govern uh, uh, these emerging AI-based technologies. And so there are massive information asymmetries and how do you bridge them? Uh, what can we also learn from past cycles of technological innovation? So that's one core theme to bridge information asymmetries and uh, look at some sort of the instrument in the toolbox for regulators how to build internal capacity. Because regulators are very much just seeing the tip of the iceberg, really. They're not seeing all of the, the research and everything else that's going underneath. And they're also not seeing perhaps some of the mechanics and, and some of the elements that are really contributing to the, uh, the functionality of, of, uh, of AI. Exactly, and there is also a big gap that we need to bridge, uh, and quite urgently so, between the technologists and the policy people and people talking about the social impact of technologies. And so it's really a hard institutional question, but also, again, going back to disciplines, going back to, to education, how do we train the next generation of leaders who are fluent enough to uh, speak both languages and understand engineering enough, as well as the world of policy and law enough, and ethics, importantly, to make these uh, decisions about governance of AI. So this is kind of one big topic. And if I may just mention another one that is more kind of substantive, uh, while well the first one is a little bit more procedural in a way, and that is um, one of the key challenges, obviously, is also how can we make sure that uh, this next generation of technologies is benefiting all people uh, in the same way? And that's a real challenge, too, because in some ways, AI-based technologies are also following a path dependency. To give an example that stuck with me, um, uh, take autonomous vehicles, right? Tremendous potential to increase uh, efficiency in transportation, but it relies, for instance, on, on Google Maps or any sort of mapping infrastructure. Now, there are big areas in cities take the favelas in, in big uh, cities in Brazil, they are unmapped. And so in a way you can make the argument that in places where the technology show the most benefit, because these are digital have-nots to begin with, uh, these populations, they're now disadvantaged yet again with the next generation of technology. And so this problem of inclusion is a really, really big one. 
and in, in our contribution and in our work more generally, of course, with many others, we're thinking hard at uh, uh, how can we close these divides and, and digital gaps, both at the infrastructure level, when you talk about uh, broadband infrastructure and the like, but then also looking at data, because as I said at the beginning, AI systems heavily relay in very large data sets. So what kind of data common can we create that uh, is also representative of very different people uh, and, and, uh, and avoiding know, colors, bias. Exactly, so avoiding yeah. bias, all these issues, exactly. Yes. And then also at the top, was it, what does it mean for the types of literacy, digital literacy we need to have as users to be able really to use these technologies to the benefit uh, of, of, our, of our societies. So lots of challenges. I think it's fair to say we're relatively early stage. Um, uh, it's a learning process, yet uh, the technology is uh, developing rapidly. And uh, the hope is that uh, through our work and also the gathering here in Geneva, uh, we can you know, have a productive exchange of what do we know, what are the unknowns yet, uh, and how can we work together to really embrace um, what I think is pretty much a, a revolution ahead and, and use it for the good and avoid some of the pitfalls. Yes, I was going to ask you here about the gathering here in Geneva, obviously. What are the chances that uh, the regulators are going to be able to get up to speed quickly enough? I mean, we're talking about here new regulatory frontiers is the, the byword for this particular conference. And obviously, as I say, there's a lo lot of uh, emerging technologies here, a lot of technologies that are fast advancing. Are they going to have to have uh, technologists working with them side by side in order to be able to, to uh, be able to regulate and to be able to develop policies that make any sense at all? Absolutely. I mean, you hit on one of our core recommendations to experiment with new ways in which policymakers uh, can bring in uh, technological experts. Now, this is not entirely new, to be fair. Uh, so there is precedent and we, uh, there are experiences uh, how to do that well. But also, as you point out, the speed and scale by which the learning has to happen is a very different game. And if you look at our world and decision making uh, among public policymakers, it's not well known for speed right now, which occasionally is also a good thing. Uh, but that's one of the key challenges. How do we synchronize um, some sort of the speed of advancement in technology with the speed of being smart about regulation that, to be sure, also supports and enables the innovation, uh, but yet also addresses some of these fundamental challenges, including uh, inclusion that I mentioned before. You mentioned learning from the past to uh, be able to regulate for the future, but I mean, how can you compare, let's say, uh, a steam train with an autonomous vehicle? Uh, because there are so many variables, I think, within that as opposed to something which is running along very straight tracks. Yeah, that's a big discussion actually still in the community as to what extent is AI really different from previous technologies. and. My personal assessment is it really depends on the altitude. Like if you take a very high altitude, well, it looks like, yes, yeah, a new technology. We know how to deal with new technologies. But if you go a little bit down and have a finer granularity, I think it's pretty, pretty different from previous uh, uh, technologies. And I think that the most important one is perhaps not so much in the technology itself, but really uh, how the technology will be used by humans. And what I mean is you see some sort of a gradual shift in autonomy. Decisions that were previously made by humans are now moving towards the machine. And that, the extent to which, the scale at which this is going to happen, I think that's unprecedented. And therefore, we are really uh, only at the beginning uh, of all of this. So this will keep us busy for a while. Yeah, absolutely. We'll need to keep our eyes and ears open. Well, we hope to catch up with you again in the future, hopefully uh, one which won't just be uh, me as an AI uh, uh, speaking to you. <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> uh, and then uh, that's another topic altogether. Exactly. But uh, Gaston, thank you very much indeed for being with us in the studio today. Thank you. My pleasure. And, you. Uh, and do join us uh, on the ITU YouTube channel and the ITU SoundCloud our channel uh, and, and our, our social media to catch up with uh, all other uh, footage and information and uh, podcasts and, and other videos that we're producing on the subject. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.